Okay, welcome everybody. This is panel nine, Themes in Digital Mapping, uh, chaired by myself. So we've got uh, two very interesting uh, presentations here. So the first will be uh, Michael Christopher Lowe. So whenever you're ready, rock and roll. All right, uh, so just a, a brief introduction. Um, so this project is, of course, part of the Appraising Risk project, uh, obviously, thanks to, to Gwen and company at McGill for putting all of this together. Um, so I'm joined in this presentation uh, with my PhD student at Iowa State, uh, Mustafa Imre Gunaida, and also my colleague from University of Minnesota, Zozan Pathevon. And then, of course, with the, the more technical support uh, from our colleagues, Luca Miro and Karim Hamami. Uh, so uh, you'll have to forgive me if the presentation is, is slightly disjointed, right? Because we've got uh, a lot of uh, moving parts and, and contributors here. Um, but I'll try and work everyone through sort of the, the, the gist of, uh, of what we're up to here. So. Uh, we are all part of the Middle East team for the Appraising Risk Project, and our sort of basic uh, contribution uh, to, to the project has been to try and do digital mapping of disease flows uh, from the Indian Ocean to the Ottoman Empire uh, from the late 18th century, uh, really through World War I. So we've put together kind of a hypothesis of what we thought we could possibly do um, with the support of a database and GIS mapping that we couldn't otherwise do with more conventional methods as Middle East specialists and Ottomanists. So uh, drawing on a collection of some 20,000 Ottoman uh, archival entries related to cholera and plague, this presentation really represents a kind of first attempt to create a database and GIS representation of Ottoman archival documents related to pandemic disease. Unlike anecdotal methods of historical research, which have generally uh, been uh, essentially limited in geography and kind of a patchwork of documents, um, this presentation really attempts to uh, deploy digital methods to identify previously overlooked patterns of disease uh, spread across time and space. Uh, and really in the initial phase of this research, I should say that this is kind of an, uh, a kind of uh, a proof of concept, if you will, uh, to really see if this, this could work. So our team performed a sample study of secondary literature uh, in Ottoman studies, both in English sources, uh, Turkish sources, and some printed Ottoman materials to identify the strengths and weaknesses in the existing historiography. So I'll give you a couple of examples here. Uh, so on the left, uh, my book, uh, which uh, really sort of the, the sort of centerpiece of it is uh, cholera outbreaks coming from India uh, via the pilgrimage to Mecca. But there are other examples. Uh, Mesut Ayar in the middle, his uh, work on uh, cholera in Istanbul, but it sort of surveys more, more broadly. Uh, Gulden Saryildiz's uh, work on uh, the quarantine system in the Hijaz and the Red Sea. Uh, and then there are many other examples, especially in Turkish, the work of uh, Ismail Yashyanlar, uh, Nuran Yildirim, but many other uh, contributors, uh, both in the historiography of the Ottoman Empire, but also in colonial history. I think about people like Sarab Mishra, uh, an India specialist, or someone like Valeska Huber working on Suez Canal, uh, to just, just to name a few. But in recent years, there's really been an uptick, I think, in interest, and I think uh, we'll see more as a result of our current pandemic situation of interest in cholera and then plague outbreaks uh, also in the 19th century as well. But there are some, uh, let's say, ruts in this historiography. So we have well-studied examples of maritime transmission, particularly focusing on places like Mecca, the Hijaz, uh, and Istanbul, uh, which stand out. By contrast, uh, we also expect to see considerable references to outbreaks in places like Iraq, Kurdistan, uh, and Eastern Anatolia. However, unlike the more well-developed literature, uh, colonial and Turkish source bases on maritime disease transmissions in the Red Sea and the Mediterranean, there really is not a kind of equivalent historiography uh, to suggest the timing and intensity 
uh, of the underlying social and environmental causes of overland disease transmissions across Iraq, Kurdistan, and really cross-border uh, transmissions between Iran and Iraq. Uh, that is much weaker uh, in, in the historiography. So in order to kind of fill this in, what we wanted to do was to basically uh, take this big corpus of of Ottoman documents, some 20,000 documents with references to cholera and plague uh, in, from the late 18th century through the early 20th century and find a way through this project to bring this treasure trove of Ottoman archival evidence into a kind of Anglophone audience. And I'll say more about, and my partners will say more about how we're trying to do that. Um, but basically we're trying to test our initial hypothesis and see what the potential divergences between maritime and overland transmissions and their treatment in the existing scholarship might look like, right? So in order to do this, we focused on uh, uh, areas in the Ottoman Empire that were Indian Ocean adjacent that we knew were most likely to be affected by these disease flows coming out of the Indian Ocean uh, and their contact in particular with the subcontinent. So we looked at uh, the Hijaz, uh, Iraq, so including the province, Ottoman, Ottoman provinces of Basra, Baghdad, uh, and Mosul, and Yemen, uh, and also adjacent areas of Kurdistan. So I'll just sort of try to sort of orient you with the images that I have here. How did we do this? Uh, what, what, what are we trying to, to get at? Um, so in the top left here, uh, we have uh, a picture basically of what the summaries, the osets uh, from the Ottoman archival uh, uh, database basically. So you get these summaries of documents and we went through these summaries and Mustafa, my PhD student, uh, put together spreadsheets uh, basically from these thousands and thousands of documents and put together a list of the relevant places uh, and documents so that we could try to map them. Now on the right hand uh, side of your screen, you'll see a typical uh, Ottoman document. Now the reason that I show this to you, uh, assuming that most of you don't read Ottoman uh, script, uh, is to kind of give you a sense of the labor. Um, you know, a, a book like the one that I wrote, you know, 400 pages, maybe a thousand footnotes, maybe a few hundred uh, Ottoman documents get used, thousands get read or sifted through. Um, you know, that could take 10 years, right? If you multiply that out to 20,000 documents, that could take lifetimes. So what we're trying to do is identify patterns and then go in and read the relevant documents to support what those patterns uh, that the GIS mapping uh, suggests to us. But basically it's targeting the research. So I just wanna hand over briefly to Mustafa, if you can jump in here and tell us a little bit about some of the work that you did to prepare this material. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, as you said, like we have these summaries and also like personal quotes with each summary, like these are like available in document state archives. We collected them first and then I used the uh, template on the like website of our project, like the appraising risk. And like, it, it is because they should, they, sh they should be like the data that I enter needs to be in a regular format. So I use this template and then I like, I paid a special focus on like some regions that we agreed on like Bada, like Iraq, Hijaz and Yemen and also Kurdistan. For now, like uh, until now, <clears throat> I just checked the summaries and tried to like enter all the information about the existence of like a uh, plague or uh, a cholera in the regions that we focus. The, for, like if I see uh, the number of like patients or deaths, I entered them, but actually the next phase of our project will be to like delve into the real documents and enter like the more detailed information about the number of patients and the number like the number of also casualties for now, we just focused on the summaries and to understand, like, to at least to have a picture of the scale of these epidemics and the existence of these epidemics and pandemics in, like, in these geographies. Because as 
Dr. Lowe mentioned, uh, if you look at the secondary lit lit literature, you see that some regions like were just ignored. Like for example, for Kurdistan, I was really shocked because in the secondary literature, you see, there are really like, we don't have lots of information about the existence of like diseases in that region or like the effects of the epidemics and pandemics on that region. But when you look at these documents, you see that actually Kurdistan was also a hotspot of diseases too. Yes. So I, I want to, to bring in uh, Professor Pahlavan uh, to talk a little bit, and I'm going to sort of uh, cycle through a number of the maps that Luca and Kareem helped us put together. And I, I hope that some of the patterns will be easy enough for everyone to, to sort out. Um, so Zozan, I'm, I'm going to sort of hand over to you, and you can let me know when you want to uh, advance a slide. Okay, sure. Thank you. Uh, first, let me thank to IOWC for bringing uh, us together um, today and for last uh, four years. Uh, thank you, Luca and Karim, for doing these wonderful maps. And thank you, Mustafa, for spending hours and hours entering this, uh, reading this summary of documents and entering this uh, data. Uh, and thank you, Chris, for making the presentation possible and showable. Uh, so let me describe, um, let me begin with the description of Kurdistan. What do we, what do we mean by Kurdistan? So um, in our understanding and particularly in my understanding of uh, Kurdistan, Kurdistan is in a kind of environmental zone uh, that actually locates between um, uh, Western Anatolia and uh, and uh, frontier uh, and Iran, Western Anatolia, like East, like Anatolia and uh, and what's called um, Iran, and uh, it's an environmental zone that it's not unique and it has multiple kind of ecological zones and it is an an, an area in. 19th century uh, inhabited by about two and a half million people and about 15 20 million animals and um and ecologically, it was uh, also like in terms of forms of subsistence, it was inhabited by pastoralists and uh, agrarians in terms of ethno-religious uh, divisions. Uh, it was um, uh, like, uh, it was home for millions of Kurds, Armenians, um, uh, Turks, Jews, uh, uh, Arabic speaking people, uh, Syriacs, Nestorians, Yazidis. Uh, it was pretty multicultural uh, and multi-ethnic uh, uh, multi-religious uh, uh, environment. So mm, when Chris started, so what is um, what we see here is that, uh, uh, and it is also for Kurdistan. Okay, uh, that's I think it's related with the number of studies that in the Ottoman historiography. So basically, in the Ottoman historiography, there are two major trends um, uh, for the history of region. Uh, so uh, the first trend. Um, uh, so this region is one of the most understudied region of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, in the entire historiography. And there are two reasons for this understudied. Uh, one reason is that the region was um, kind of um, the, one of the center of the Armenian genocide uh, in 1915. And the second reason is that um, the quest Kurdish question that was inherited from Ottoman Empire to uh, Turkish Republic. And uh, because of these two ideological and two cont like still ongoing uh, debates uh, and questions, uh, this region has been understudied by both Turkish origin or Kurdish origin or Arabic uh, Arab origin uh, scholars, but also Western scholars who it, it was kind of an ideological choice. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, from here, if you see, if you can follow me, it's just like east of Ankara, uh, the capital city of today's Turkey was kind of uh, the region that you don't want to uh, work. And that's why when Mustafa started to kind of say the number of studies we don't have, it is related of these ideological and political choices that actually forced us um, to work on this, uh, uh, make our job much more difficult to understand, uh, to make these maps. Um, 
so it is it's an extremely understudied region and when you look at the history of this region for example the arabic was kind of the um uh, entrepot uh, up until uh, the rise of beirut uh, in 19th century it was an entrepot of the, the connected to aleppo and well connected to baghdad and then black sea area uh, but with the development of with the establishment of suez canal with the opening of suez canal in 1869 the region kind of started to lose it is um was called uh, it is uh, trade centric uh, um, importance that was actually running from uh, eastern uh, running from indian ocean world to the region so uh and when what we see here in this map is that um and compared to other parts of uh, anatolia central anatolia or like Beirut, Damascus, uh, or Jerusalem, we see like, you know, the hotspots are major city centers like the Arabic here, like Erzurum, Mosul, and Baghdad. Um, Chris, can we go to the next one? So, and this is the primary source. When we look at the primary source, however, the hotspots, the number of hotspots increased tremendously. And what is more striking is that the level of integration between Iraq and Kurdistan. And I think what makes this study is so important uh, for our partnership project is that showing that actually Kurdistan was much more integrated to Iraq than to the other parts of uh, empire. And I think this confirms this shows kind of the pre early modern uh, story that Faisal Hussein has been uh, telling us about how Kurdistan was supplying timber, uh, grain, and um, and arms uh, for for keeping the Ottoman authority in Iraq in early modern uh, period. And what we see the level of integration from early modern to the modern period is actually was growing. That's one uh, thing. And the second critical thing that we should be aware is that in this map what we see is that uh, the the attention if we keep our attention a bit out of uh, urban spaces and go to the rural areas uh, it is the the jump the kind of the questions increase much more so here is my fundamental when when Lucas sent these maps uh, to us I was kind of fascinated to see uh, the level of integration here is kind of um, from east of um, the Arbikir to the Lake Van and to, to the northern Mosul. This kind of a re uh, rectangular story uh, is that um, uh, it's, it's like when we see is this is are the nomadic zones. These are the nomadic zones that have been inhabited by um, thousands of pastoral nomads and uh, that were moving, that were transhuman, most of them, moving between northern pastures and southern plains, uh, like especially most of them were kind of inhabited uh, in, in, in this winter time. They would live in these areas basically from north of Mosul to, um, to Aleppo in northern Syria. And in the summertime, they will go uh, to the pasture lands that are located in these areas and um so i'm i'm in a quarantine hotel that's why i can't show you the sources that i had at home but uh here when i looked at this map it was also remember I, I just remembered from 1840s uh if you chris uh if you go to the next slide uh, so from 1840s i do remember some british sources were actually telling us that during the 18, early 1840s break, uh, cholera break in the region, like cholera break up in the region, and what it was that um, uh, was called uh, uh, the outbreak, because of outbreak along the rivers, pastoralists kind of deserted the river beds and were kind of running away to the, uh, I think, to the, to, to the pasture land, to the higher lands. And that was kind of month of Ramadan. And the British uh, uh, um, uh, Council of Mosul was just like saying that this is the story that actually is going to kind of uh, affect uh, their uh, their uh, uh, form of economic subsistence because they usually they had to be in the riverbeds that was providing sufficient grasslands to their to their animals. So um, and when we look at here again, it's the rural areas are really kind of hotspots. So in the history so we were aware that the the primary the secondary literature is telling us that we should look at the the central kind of um trade roads as well as uh, the um 
the urban centers that the epicenter of the uh, of the uh, cholera or other sorts of uh, uh, epidemics but what about the uh, migration routes of the nomads and the nomadic zones so i think this this project will kind of make uh, the story much more complicated and that has more um, uh, kind of uh, roles uh, and the the second thing i think is the uh, the relationship also between this 1840s and 1890s, uh, the Kurdistan was actually experiencing a four major uh, drought series in this period. So the first one, as um, as Isakar was uh, talking about yesterday in my article, is that the first one is 1845-46, and the the, the other uh, three ones are um, they happened in late uh, uh, 19th century, basically from 1879 to 1893. And these maps um, here, the hot spots are definitely kind of overlapping uh, the crisis of uh, what's called um, uh, the, the crisis of drought and the relationship between drought and kind of uh, spread of the cholera, or cholera outbreaks in, in the region. And here again, the integration of the Baghdad and, uh, and uh, uh, what's called uh, uh, and Kurdistan is once again and uh, shows up. It's stuff like it's, it is very clear. Um, so I think, do we have more maps, Chris? Yes. Okay. Oh, and here. So what we see again, the 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 understudied region comes up, and what also kind of clear is that the 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 relationship between the Arbekir and Erzurum, or the relationship between Baghdad and the Arbekir. So basically, what I kind of saw is that the relationship and the integration or mobility of people or diseases was much higher between the Arbekir, which is the southwest of uh, southeast of Kurdistan, between southeast of Kurdistan and Baghdad, rather than uh, between south of southeast of Kurdistan with its northern part of Kurdistan. And that is the geography uh, comes up here. Uh, one factor is geography, and the other factor is that um, is uh, is the uh, what's called uh, the uh, the mobility of pastoralists again here because uh, here uh, the, the the migration roads we don't have a lot of migration roads between the Arbekir and Arzurum but rather than between the Arbekir and uh, and Mosul and in terms of the uh, the like the story of um, kind of 1890s and 1940 uh, again the 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 kind of it speaks to each other but I think. Uh, as Mustafa said, we really have to kind of give more attention to the uh, to the uh, as, uh, ruler areas to understand uh, the nature and the structure of the uh, the, the disease uh, in nineteenth century um, uh, 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 Ottoman Empire. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in, and I mean, I think it's very clear if you can look at this series of maps, right? Um, if we look at the secondary sources, we see really big hotspots for Jeddah and Mecca, the quarantine island of Cameron, the port of Hudaydah in Yemen. We see lots of Red Sea activity. We see lots of red dots, uh, you know, sort of in Western Anatolia along the Mediterranean. We see it less for Iraq and Kurdistan. But when you get into the primary sources, as Zozan suggests, the primary sources suggest a very different story, right? We still see Jeddah, Mecca, the Red Sea represented well, but in the primary sources, Iraq and Kurdistan just light up and stand out so, so visibly. Um, and I think that this map from 1890 to 1940 is really instructive. Um, if you look at all of these uh, dots around Istanbul, Ankara, Western Anatolia, the Mediterranean, um, it shows the priorities of the historiography, right? That people are writing about Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, uh, contemporary Turkey and and not Kurdistan, right? Um, and that the historiography is somehow leaving those things out. If we look here at Hijaz, for example, you, it's a little bit hard to see from this illustration, but you can actually see an overlapping uh, sort of blue and red. So the Jidda and Mecca dots are, are purple um, if you look closely. So you see an, a correspondence between the primary and the secondary. In other words, the literature is actually covering what's there in the archive, um, and it's very well represented. But when we get to a place like Yemen, for example, you see big dots 
uh, on Cameron and Hudeda, representing maritime roots and interests of colonial historians connecting India with the Red Sea. But when we get into the interior, into the mountains, into the tribal zones, just Kaukaban or Sanaa, Beit al faqih those places aren't discussed in the literature. When we come into Kurdistan, we see a similar kind of thing, as Zozan uh, suggests, where you know basically these rural nomadic zones are not showing up in the secondary literature, but they are in fact well covered in the governmental documents themselves. They just haven't been written about. So that really, I think, gives us some sense of the work that we need to do that otherwise wouldn't have been uh, suggested um, without a kind of project like this. Um, you know, you, you see with this Iraq map, again, a correspondence. Baghdad, the primary and the secondary somewhat line up, but you know, it's, it's not nearly as clean uh, as some of the other places. So, Zozan, did you want to, to add something? Uh, no, just if you go back to, uh, to, to the, one of the maps, uh, just the previous one, um, I just want to underline something. So, okay, when we look at, if you look this look at this map, but the secondary sources would just like center the city centers, the Arbikir, Arzurum, uh, or Kars, or Van. But a closer look, this is here. What you see, Jizre or Jizire, is the center where the nomads from Mosul, like from the plain of Mosul, would go to the up to the hills uh, pasture land, and they would pass through Jizre, Jizire, uh, to to go to the pasture land. And this is a critical station because there is a bridge over the Tigris, and that is a zone where nomads would pay their taxes. Uh, the Anal sheep taxes station is in here. And when you look at the, the dots, the size of dot here, it is almost equal to the Arbikir. So, and I think uh, the, like, I'm not suggesting that nomads were kind of the disease carriers, but we should bring their roles as important as uh, trade, as important as merchants or uh, shipyards. Uh, yeah, that was, that was my point, yeah. So just, just briefly to, to try and sort of uh, give some sense of the conclusions uh, that we, we see in these, uh, these maps and hope to sort of uh, delve into as we get, in, get further into the project and really sort of start to deal with the documents themselves. Our, our sort of tentative conclusions are that the secondary literature shows a strong bias towards hydrolated and Red Sea slash Mediterranean maritime routes of cholera transmission between India and the Ottoman Empire. Mecca, Hijaz, the ports and quarantine stations of the Red Sea, Istanbul, and non-Kurdish Anatolia are all better represented in both English and Turkish works on public health and epidemic disease. Likewise, there's an overall bias toward maritime surveillance in the literature connected to both colonial archival and consular priorities and their resulting documentation and the internationalized nature of the Ottoman Board of Health. I, I think really what we see in some respects is that the colonial archives are uh, leading the Ottomanists around by the nose. And here I blame myself as, as part of that trend as well. Uh, and you know, trying to sort of self-correct a bit. Um, I think a related issue is that even scholars working with Ottoman documents are often, I think, deeply influenced by the availability of supporting evidence from a European archives. So those two literatures trying to speak to one another um, create certain kinds of uh, uh, conclusions, I think. Um, let's see here. Yes. Um, a couple of other things that I wanted to point out before uh, uh, wrapping up here is while maritime ports and their nodes of uh, disease transmission are clear, nomadic zones and rural transmission patterns in Iraq, Kurdistan, uh, and the uh, interior of Yemen show the gap between the available archival documents and the priorities of the secondary literature. Um, and of course, as uh, Zozan was suggesting, the overland and nomadic routes of transmission in Iraq, Basra, Baghdad, Mosul, and Kurdistan are per poorly understood uh, in the secondary literature, despite their uh, abundance of documentation in the Ottoman archival documents. Uh, and then a final thing that I would just put on the table, I think we can discuss, and I know that uh, if Issachar is still with us, he can say some things about, about this as well in Mustafa. But Overlapping maritime and riverine, riverine uh, modes of transmission in Iraq and Kurdistan also connect with 
the Persian Gulf and their intersection with overland routes of transmission from Qajar Iran via the Shi'i pilgrimages, the Atabat to places like Najaf and Karbala and Kazamain, um, and the cross-border uh, corpse traffic uh, basically, uh, Shi'i Muslims wanting to, to bury their dead in the shrine, the shrine cities of places like Najaf and Karbala. So I think that there are a lot of things that really haven't been well accounted for uh, on this Iraqi uh, Kurdistan frontier. So I'll leave it there. Uh, Zozan, did you want to add anything before we drop off? All right. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you so much. Uh, okay, next up, we've got Karim Hamani, Peter Hind, and Luca Baird, IOWC. So just when you thought you heard about enough diseases in the past year and a half, here's another presentation about diseases. So hi, my name is Karim. Um, I'm a geospatial research assistant at the IOWC. Luca and Peter, if you may introduce yourselves as well. Hi, my name is Luca. I'm a spatial analyst and geographer with the IOWC. And uh, yeah, I'm Peter Hind, a longtime uh, student employee at the IWC. All right, so, and our project is Epidemic Environments, Spatial Analysis of Disease Risk in 19th Century India and Madagascar. So a little bit of an introduction about um, what this paper is about. Um, so there have been various studies looking at the relationship between climate with disease and with disease risk specifically, um, and with an ever-changing environment, ever-changing climate, it's important that we strengthen these relationships um, into the future so we may better adapt and prepare for such situations um, as climate change continues to develop. In regards to future, mod um, future modeling research, uh, modern statistics is increasingly widespread. However, data on both climate and disease becomes increasingly really scarce the farther, we, the farther back we look. Um, this data could prove useful to providing accurate modeling um, of future disease in the incidences as well as just in general um, historical analyses. Um, our goal for our research then was to, um, using late 19th and early 20th century data, map out these incidences in India and Madagascar and observe potential link linkages between um, environmental factors and specific diseases such as malaria, tuberculosis, and other respiratory gastrointestinal diseases. So our methodology involved the, the digitization of maps for the creation of unique shape files to store the historical population disease data from the digi from digitized statistical documents and combine that with various um, various environmental data sets in order to see what we could find. So um, I'll hand it off to Peter. All right, uh, thanks Karim. Uh, it's good to see uh, some familiar faces after what's been a pretty tough year. So good to see everybody. Um, so our first case study that we decided to work on um, involves a study of sort of disease data in India from approximately 1888 to 1910. Um, part of the reason why we chose this um, is that it's an area and time period I know reasonably well, and the data is relatively robust for the time period, and it's fairly easily available. So um, a lot of the work is great seeing that last presentation because a lot of the work that goes into this kind of stuff is really kind of back-end stuff that makes what you see possible rather than you know what you see uh, it's like you know your first painting takes a long time when you have to teach yourself how to paint right um but anyway i can go a little bit into our um first case study so this um we use two sources of data here one is to just get population figures which i took from the census of india um Long story short, the first modern census um, that covers the area that's now India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Burma um, is completed in 1872. It takes a couple of years to do, but it's completed in 1872. Uh, it's pretty good, but from 1881 and every 10 years after, um, they do a complete census of India. Some of these early censuses are absolute feats of you know, organization in a sense. Um, a lot of the data they end up collecting and they collect and publish you know, dozens of volumes every 10 years. We're talking thousands upon thousands of pages. Um, a lot of what they collect is pretty dubious. Um, I've got an example up here that's age data, which is you know, next to useless. But um, long story short, for our purposes, the actual sort of head count in terms of population um, was and still is considered reasonably reliable. And it's great for our purposes because it's presented in a 
fairly granular manner. Like you can get down to the district level. Um, these are areas of a couple hundred square kilometers. Um, you can get, you know, population figures that are as accurate as any modern census. A lot of the other stuff, caveat emptor, be really careful if you plan to use it. But um, for that, that's good. We've got granular population data. Um, and then our second source are um, disease mortality figures, which um, I've actually taken in this case from a publication known as the Statistical Abstracts of British India. Um, these give us, um, starting from mid-1870s, these give us information um, about cause of death in at the provincial level. Um, ironically, our own pandemic, there are more detailed uh, versions of these statistics that deal with smaller geographic areas. Unfortunately, our own pandemic has prevented us from getting our hands on them, but um, they're fine. Now, these are a little bit harder to work with than the population data. Um, I'll point out just a few quick examples. I could probably give an entire talk on why you should be careful with these things. Um, you'll notice um, fevers is one of the largest categories uh, or one of the largest causes of death that gets recorded, um, which is sort of something that today we'd understand as a symptom of whatever kills you rather than the thing that um, kills you itself. Um, you'll also know if you know anything about 19th century history um, for various um, political reasons, um, some nefarious, some sort of accidental. Um, things like, uh, you know, famine killed tens of millions of people in India during the 19th century, and that is officially the cause of zero deaths, according to this methodology. So um, there's a lot to be worried about, to be careful with if you want to use this kind of stuff. Um, but for diseases such as cholera and, say, smallpox, um, those are fairly well understood in medical terms by the period we're after, um, and they're sort of distinct enough that you don't have to worry too much about um, that. I, now, to, who's to say these aren't being fudged for, you know, again, various purposes. We've all been through this with COVID data. It doesn't need to be maliciously hidden to be wrong, um, or at least hard to compare with other sources. But um, long story short, for our purposes here, um, file this under good enough. For a, for a test case. So that's part of it. Um, Luca will get into what we actually try to do with this when it comes to Luca's turn to speak, but I'll, I think I'll leave it at that. Corinne? Uh, Kareem, you're muted. Wonderful. All right. So um, regarding our Madagascar disease data, um, this data was sourced from Le Journal Officiel de Madagascar et Dependance. Um, which contains simple statistics of multiple major cities, but only consistently displayed tables for um, three of those, unfortunately. So it was Antanarivo, Fianaranzo, and Tamatave. Um, these monthly tables, they contain births, deaths, population numbers for the most part, um, but most importantly, the causes of deaths reported in each month. Um, so data ranged from 1900 to 1912. However, the, consistently spe the consistency specific, um, significantly drops in early 1908, um, but it still provides us with a solid um, seven and a half or so years of, of disease data to look at. Um, this data suffered from some of the same issues that Peter mentioned. For example, um, a, lot of, a lot of deaths were attributed to fever or diarrhea, which um, a lot of the time is more of a symptom of another disease. Um, so that was something we had to work around. And as well as a couple of combinations of disease, for example, typho malaria, typho malaria or tuberculosis and malaria. Um, and in that sort of um, frame, we can't really decide which one was the specific thing that killed them. Um, so those kind of um, numbers complicate things and we've included them in separate um, values as well. So um, several of the variations of the same disease were grouped together. And you'll see here, if I change the slide. Yeah, so several of different variations of the same disease were grouped together. Um, we have like tuberculosis, pulmonaire, holt, tuberculosis grouped together into one value, just to try to make things simple. Um, and yeah, all the data that we collected were placed in both India and Madagascar, were placed into similar tables that follow our ILWC templates. Um, this is a bit simplified, these gaps will be filled once we do the analysis, but generally what it, every value includes is spatial coordinates as well so that we can assign these to the specific administrative boundaries if they are um, smaller than the administrative boundaries that we have available. Um, so yeah, that's about it for me. Luca will go on about cyclones and spatial yeah. methodology. So 
Kareem and Peter talked about how we source the historical disease data. Um, and we wanted to take an environmental data set and combine it with that uh, kind of as a proof of concept, kind of as a way to, to utilize a good data set. So we took the hurricane track data sets from NOAA, and these actually go from 1842 to, to the present day. Um, and you know, this is the Indian Ocean world. You can sort of see these are all the cyclone tracks, all the monsoon tracks, uh, and their landfall points. Uh, so we took this large data set and we uh, combined it with the disease data set. We head to the next slide. And so I'm going to kind of uh, uh, introduce our spatial methodology. So a lot of what we've been doing is actually generating our own historically relevant administrative boundaries and locations and gazetteer entries um, from historical materials, from cartographic materials, so that we can then layer that disease data and that environmental data in a way that's spatially linked. Uh, that allows us to see patterns. It allows us to, to do analysis. Uh, the analysis we did in this project is relatively simple, but it becomes more and more powerful. Um, so our, our goal is kind of to, to, to look at these disease outbreak locations, look at weather phenomenon, add that into a spatial context that is historically meaningful, and then just look for the patterns that jump out when you just get to look at, at data on a map. Um, this allows us to kind of extract uh, contextual information, statistical information. It allows us to kind of also verify or complicate the kind of historical record that's already been established. Uh, and then at the end of it, we end up producing these standardized tables of data and shape files, which are, are both, they both end up being helpful for everyone else who's involved. Uh, if we go to the next slide. So when I, when I describe creating historically relevant uh, shape files, what we've been doing is basically taking uh, historical maps. In this case, it's actually a contemporary map of historical districts in India. And we've developed a system that allows us to take that original map, which is just a flat image, and then georectify it so that it's linked to, to its actual location on Earth. And then we digitize all the lines on that map and clean it up. And what that gives us is what you can see under number three on the right, which is a uh, historically relevant, spatially linked uh, set of India districts. Uh, we actually have these for multiple census uh, data sets. And as far as we know, they're actually the only shape files of this type that are currently in existence. Uh, if we head to the next slide, Kareem will talk a little bit about, about the shape files they generated. Right, so um, our Madagascar maps were created using various ethnographic and laboratory maps uh, by both um, Alfred, the works of Alfred and Guillaume Candidier in Madagascar, as well as the French military cartographic service after occupation starts to settle down. So um, the former was less detailed, but luckily they included a ton of, it's less visually detailed, but they included a lot of um, written detail about the borders of each administrative division. Um, including sort of what rivers and mountain ridges specifically are the boundaries of uh, specific areas. Um, so we combined these kind of maps as well as the text with a hydrographic data set um, that's actually made at McGill by Professor Bernard Leonard um, that contains river and in his lab, but um, contains rivers and uh, watersheds of specific rivers as well. Um, and these were used to help guide sort of the lines based on both our map as well as um, what the descriptions are when they are available. Um, so these were used to create um, three different maps thus far. Uh, there are other ones, but they're ethnographic maps. Um, the three different administrative maps, one for 1895 on the verge of colonization, one in 1905 and one in 1910, um, that cover sort of our study period that we're looking at. Um, and so, yeah, these map maps as well as the ones in India um, as is for as far as we know, yeah, unique for contributions for this for of of these, sorry, of this area, and they are there to receive any more data and be filled in and to be used by whoever really wants to do research on the field. So yeah, and so when we talk about using that data in a spatial sense, uh, here are some of those cyclone tracks and cyclone landfall points when we just have the bare. Uh, the bare kind of uh, borders, the, the general national, contemporary national borders. And we can see where the landfall points are. We can see where cyclone tracks are. It's interesting to do this kind of visualization. Um, and here are two years where there's heavy cyclone activity. If we head to the next slide, actually, uh, it's another set of years. We have heavy cyclone activity. What we're actually kind of looking for is 
one interesting patterns that link that heavy uh, that heavy cyclone activity to potential kind of uh, changes in disease. And two, we want to kind of alter and attach this data to our historical shape files. So if we head actually to the next map, we can see what that actually looks like together. So the, the pale green dots here are the cyclone landfall points. And we've taken the India district data. And when we take the cyclone tracks, and, and this is actually a mixture of different cyclone data, it's uh, intensity, wind speed, uh, number of different strikes within the same season. This is uh, 1888, just one year. Uh, we can actually see the patterns that they trace within the administrative uh, divisions in the country. And obviously that has relevance for figuring out how uh, uh, aid moves, how the economy moves. And we can also just kind of see interesting patterns. And, and one of the things that's interesting, interesting here is you can see that there is this loop in the middle of India. And that's actually multiple cyclones uh, looping from one half of the map to the other uh, and causing extensive damage, mostly uh, towards the coast. Uh, and this is what kind of allows us to, to be able to combine this data together. Uh, and we, we chose the India files here for proof of concept, but this will work to link any of those district or administrative shape files with disease data and any environmental data. Honestly, uh, not even just disease data, we can kind of link multiple data sets like this together. Um, if we head to the next slide. So when we have all this data organized, then we can very, very quickly and easily pull kind of patterns back out of it. And none of us are, are, are specialists in the weather, specialists in disease. Uh, so as we pull these patterns out, we're just kind of looking at them uh, it kind of in the more general sense. Uh, we want other people to kind of take a look at that and, and, and see what those patterns look like. As you can see in both India and Madagascar, the cyclone intensity happens in these kind of wave patterns where it's, it's very, very intense uh, and then it kind of drops off. And they're not entirely uh, temporally linked. If you remember that first slide showing the cyclone tracks, you can see that they, they kind of split off into these different weather systems. And I think uh, that's potentially one explanation for why there's a, a lag between the, the two areas. We head to the next slide. If we separate those out. Oh. Sorry, Luca, not to uh, interrupt you, just uh, maybe four or five minutes left just so we can- Perfect, have perfect. Um, so yeah, if we pull those uh, apart, we can kind of see uh, definitely for, for the India data, there's uh, kind of more intense cyclone patterns uh, and distributions. For the Madagascar data, there's a couple of these years which look, look like they're missing. Those are years with, with very, very minimal uh, cyclone activity. Um, there's actually one year in here that does have no recorded cyclones. Um, but pulling this data out in this way is what allows us to quickly identify those gaps and then to quickly analyze them to see if they're actually gaps in the data or if they follow the sensible pattern. We've, what we've kind of found is that obviously uh, cyclones and monsoon systems follow general patterns, but they have locally distinct characteristics in uh, temporality. Okay, I'm just sending this link to this like GIS panel. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, if we head to the next slide. Um, so then we can do the same for the disease data. And as we're pulling disease data out, we're trying to look for patterns that we can see because we have that district uh, data. So if we look to the top, this is kind of all of India from 1894 to 1903. There are these general patterns, you can call her a smallpox, uh, dysentery, diarrhea. But if we look down below, towards the right, uh, Madras and Assam are two areas where it's on the eastern coast of India. They're being exposed to very, very heavy cyclone activity. Mysore, uh, more towards the west, is being exposed to less cyclone activity. And as you can see, uh, obviously the distribution of diseases is based on population. But if you look at the relative amounts of diseases, we see a real interesting kind of shift away from what we know to be water important diseases like cholera uh, towards, uh, in this case, in Mysore, there's huge uh, smallpox outbreaks and minimal cholera. Um, and we can kind of pull those patterns out of that data continually. And it's kind of the value of having uh, this data set to work with. Um, and yeah, so uh, if, uh, if uh, Kareem and, uh, <clears throat> and Peter want to add anything, I also want to add that a lot of this work was done with another RA who worked with us called Henry Coombs, uh, who put a lot of uh, effort and energy into this and who we couldn't have done it without. 